this is a project yeah. that began mm -hmm. with an inventory, yes. began with a document, and there's been a search for other traces of this person that thus far has not turned up very much. I think I'd start out by saying that you're a little bit richer than you described because you know where she was born, where she was born, where she lived when she made that inventory, and the occupations of her husband is her first husband was a merchant and her second is a reform minister. So I already as an historian, when I have several things, I begin to think where can we go with those things? And I often face this in my current work on the other Dutch colony of Suriname <laughs> and where I may have little more than that, that is a name, perhaps a, a birth date, the name of a husband and his occupation, the size of a plantation and an inventory. But there's still a great deal that you can do with a limited things because you can start building a world as you've done in your exhibit around Margarita by thinking about and examining what kinds of experiences someone would have married to a reformed minister, what are the duties of a reformed wife, we could get other kinds of ways, what kinds of stores people had in New York, maybe you don't have her store, but what kinds of stores. I think we know something about the people that she was selling to, and so you can build up a world of her buyers, of her neighbors. This is the way the historian works. You start off with what you have, and then you try to fill in as closely as you can with a parallel evidence, analogous evidence, always being very clear that it's not your own person, that there's always a possibility of something being exceptional or different. But you kind of build up a world, and then you can begin to ask, when you see something particularly noteworthy about your figure, is she representative or not? Well, I'll say all the women that I meet in Suriname, except for the Caribs and Arawaks, <laughs> arrive there in the first generation from elsewhere. Either they're kidnapped from Africa, uh, or sold from Africa, or they come uh, as parts of family from the Netherlands or other parts of Europe. None of them that I know of have made the kind of trajectory that Margarita van Verick has. That is, coming to a former Dutch colony, in this case of, of New York, from the Pacific. That's a very interesting trajectory and something that would make a lot of difference to me in interpreting her life. She's had an unusual experience. What we were just doing was sort of the kind of work that you do when you're trying to fill out a world around a person and, under and understand their networks and so on. We're, uh, and so it's, it just shows, once again, it isn't just an inventory, right. but the inventory is an opening into uh, a set of relationships and a style of living. <laughs> We thought of the inventory as a kind of checklist. Mm -hmm. As we started thinking about it, we then thought about it as a map, because since she had traveled around the world, she acquired goods in different places, mm -hmm. whether it's the East India objects acquired in the East, mm -hmm. or some of the, the linens which she probably acquired back in the Netherlands, and then the trade goods that she would have sold in her shop. And then we thought about it also as a genealogy. The different family members who uh, are both accounted for, in the will in particular, her children, mm -hmm. but also the different family members of an older generation mm -hmm. who created the opportunity for her to move, for instance, to the East. Mm -hmm. So we really tried to think about it as a kind of multi Layered, layered document. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've also thought about the challenges of an inventory. I mean, there are, there are possibilities, mm -hmm. and then there are challenges. The emotional side of things. Mm -hmm. How do you think about accessing that through a list of goods? I would find it hard to uh, look for affect in an inventory. I think you could look for sensibility <laughs> in an inventory and judgment and taste, interest. Of course, it depends on whether you have to sort out whether it's an inventory of goods for sale uh, or an inventory of personal possessions. When I'm looking to recreate the life of a figure about whom I have lots of gaps and where I have very little, if nothing, written by the person, 
and perhaps very little written in description of the person by someone who knew him or her, I have to work quite hard to get situations uh, where I get feeling. Now the first question I'd ask is, why would you need it? If you're trying to create a whole portrait of someone, Margarita von Verich, you might want to get it because you thought about her relationship to her two husbands, what those marriages were like, the quality of feeling in those marriages, or Margaret Van Varick's relationship to her children. You might not get a great deal of affect there, but you could at least see what kind of gifts are provided, what kind of concern is shown. Since she died after her husband, there are ways with certain kinds of documents that you can get at, um, at affect. In the inventory, there are lots of silver children's toys. Well, there we are. And are they in her own possessions or in the things for sale or They're both? They're her own possessions. I think that's wonderful. In the inventories that I have in Suriname, I don't recall much in the way of silver children's toys. I'll go back and look. But this seems like a very interesting mother. Now, when I think of how to fill that, that in, that's, that's something that really you can do a lot with. There's a great deal of writing now on child rearing and education of children. Rudolf Decker has done a whole collection on autobiographical memoirs, either by people in the Netherlands when they're quite young, or memoirs in which interesting things are said about children. And he has some for the 17th century. Uh, one from an artisanal family, one from a farm family, some from a middle class family in the Netherlands, so that one could, um, if one wanted to thicken around Margarita Van Verick's silver toys, one could get, really do quite a lot. So I'm already seeing a kind of a world that one could do, uh, just starting with toys, always knowing that you're not literally getting Margarita's example, but that you can place her in a, in a context. If we think of Margarita Van Verick, we know she's literate, she has books, we know that she has a, a circle of, of people with whom she's keeping accounts, so that and I think we can begin to imagine something about her knowledge about business, about religion, about travel, about the customs of people. And I think, in terms of interiority, how she felt about the American Indians, the indigenous peoples that she saw, I don't know how her, she, what her sensibility was, but in thinking about her, I would be attentive to the fact that she had already been in connection with a non-Christian world, a world of people brought up very differently from what she knew in the, in the Netherlands, as well as her experience in the Netherlands. I would wonder about whether there were any patterns that we know about of prize things for gift exchange that one might imagine could be discovered also uh, speculated about. Does her will mention anything special about gifts to the children? The will is focused on the children. Um, and there are gifts, mostly it's actually of money, mm -hmm. coin, mm -hmm. silver coins, mm -hmm. Arabian mm -hmm. ducats. Oh, really? There's a gold Arabian ducat. To the children? Yes, or? and they're all wrapped up in napkins. You're a lucky man. I'm always wondering when I'm looking at gifts, what they're wrapped up in. That's wonderful. I mean, maybe in the 17th century you know a great deal about this, but when I was doing my gift book in the 16th century, I kept wondering about how were these presented to people? What were they wrapped up in? Were they put into boxes and then the boxes were open? Well, I'm, I think that's wonderful. It's, it's lovely that you know how she kept them. That's lovely. <laughs> I've done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of will in my time, and I'm doing them, I've done them for the early period, and I'm doing from, from the, now from 18th century Suriname, and I very ra rarely find anything about how things are presented. You sometimes get the sense when you see pictures of, of how things might come in a, in a chest, that, but uh, that's, that's lovely. Often um, in women's wills, in the 16th, 17th, century, you find them giving garments or bedclothes to relatives. I mean, jewelry is given not only to children, but to their heirs, sometimes to friends. I would wonder whether Margarita von Varick had servants to whom she might also have given a garment or some, some linens or something of that kind. Of course, did she have servants? She had a slave. Oh, she had a slave. 
So now you're telling me that she had a slave. Okay, I knew that there were slaves. So was she a, a, a slave, an African slave, of African or, or we don't know. Indian origin? I think it's a woman slave. I see. Oh, well, did she provide for her manumission in no. the... Uh, did she try to Christianize her, do you know? I would immediately ask those questions. If, if she has a reformed husband, it does not mean that he would necessarily try to Christianize her. I've been working very hard on this in Suriname, and uh, where the reformed pastors uh, all have plantations, some of them really huge sugar plantations with lots of slaves. And the pattern of, uh, and this is in the, in the 18th century, even later, and the pattern of conversion is to select only those who they think are quite unusual and convert them. They, they might baptize babies, but they don't involve them in education or becoming church members if they're free later on. So it's not automatic that if you have a minister, but still, she's in a household where Christian teaching and preaching is going on, and that slave would know something about Christianity by by the end. She might be just as happy to be left with her own gods. <laughs> there are special bequests and then there's just this long list of yeah. things. I would think that there would be some objects that came in perhaps as gifts uh, or perhaps were purchased but were from that period of her life that would have a special status and would be passed on to her children. I'm reminded of a very interesting project by the wonderful anthropologist uh, William Christian, who's now doing a study of things, an ethnography of things. Uh, here, not from an inventory, but from actually living with a family uh, in their last years, uh, uh, big collectors, but not fancy collectors. Uh, they were professors, college professors, who collected things that they were interested in. And looking at uh, all the stories that were around each object in their house uh, and what then happened to them as they had to give up that house and, and, and move. Very, very interesting to be sure people's relations from the things in late 20th century Madison, Wisconsin are not going to be the same as in late 17th century uh, Flatbush. But it's suggestive. I, I've seen his filming uh, of these, this family, talking about their things, touching their things, saying, telling the stories about them. And one can imagine, um, partly because we know it from writing at the time in the 17th century, but one can imagine conversations of Margarita Van Verick with her children, maybe as she first shows them these objects, or with the women uh, who are members of her congregation. Oh yes, I got this through. It was given to my uncle, or it was given to my first husband. Uh, or it came in from the Japanese trade. So this is a way in which objects are enriched in that way. Since her daughter ended up marrying a very gifted silversmith, I would think about that as perhaps a legacy that might come from the kind of family, those silver toys <laughs> that surrounded her when she was a girl. Of course, daughters go off and do all kinds of things, we know. They don't necessarily follow in their family's footsteps. But still, there is a kind of relationship to crafting things and to silver that, that you see is a, a continuity that one might think of. So how do you think about the Dutch minister's wife? with all of her, you know, the Japanese gowns and the uh, Indian textiles sitting in her house in Flatbush. Did you think she felt that her world had, was a little bit less uh, elegant or something because she was, she was there? Would they be invited to any of the homes of the prominent Dutch families? Presumably they, they would have been invited Were there any of them in the congregation? Did he have any wealthy people in his, really wealthy people in Flatbush? There were some, not very wealthy. It was a farming community for it was the a farming most part. Community. Well, now we're back to our question of the yeah. affect of things, yeah. right? I mean, it's not only the emotional connection to her yeah. family, but she has these luxurious garments, textiles, yes. wall hangings. Yes, and they are there going about in their beaver hats. <laughs> and she may have used them or seen them in use yeah. in Malacca. Yeah. And now she has them in her kas in yeah. her house, but there are, aren't... Are there occasions that she can wear them? Would she have worn a coverall, a shawl? Could she have worn it to Sabbath service? She might have, but then what are the degrees of propriety? 
Well, I'm sure if I were her and I would be in that situation, I'd give some of them away as gifts to some of the other ladies in the congregation to win them over. <laughs> that would be my strategy. I don't know. And it might even be not just projecting from the 21st, 20th century back into the past, but it might, you know, gift exchange was very important as a form of alliance and as making friends. And, and uh, it would be a way to disarm jealousy if, uh, you know, I, you have the inventories of some of the other people uh, in her neighborhood. Well, the, we, nobody's done a survey to try and map out and to see whether names in her community or on her debt list have uh, inventories that survive. I think that your exhibit has already got ready several master's theses, uh, if not doctoral theses, of things that people could, could run with. I mean, that would be, you could really try to set up, uh, uh, instead of just taking individual inventories, actually look up, do a network, uh, and a network where you follow, you could maybe follow objects a little bit. One question I'd like to ask um, has to do with, with the question of using material evidence as uh -huh. opposed to textual evidence, and how you feel that the challenges or the opportunities are of using things mm -hmm. to talk? Well, I think they're, I haven't done it very much myself, just a little, but I think it's, it's wonderful that uh, you use, uh, you know, you use whatever you, whatever you can. I like to use them in connection with each other. It's not that I think the texts are more real, but I think that they, they really must speak uh, to each other. One of the things that I like about textuals physical things at any point, including books. I use books as physical objects all the time, not just for their content, but that, that's been a main part of my teaching, that is the way the book looks, the inscriptions in it. But it, it is a, a moment of um, affect. And I always say this to my students when we meet in the rare book room, to what I want to introduce them to, seeing the book as an object, as a material object, um, that you actually have in your hands something that was held in the hands <laughs> of someone in 1542 or 1831 or 1702 and that that's I think that that's I feel that when I'm using with the manuscripts too that they they well at least you once held and it's part of my sense of you once held this part of my sense of a of a of a what I sometimes think of as a a contract with the past is that I got this because you wrote it or you made it and my sense of of obligation to them, I'll use the language of gifts rather than the language of contract, my sense of obligation comes from the fact that, that they gave this to me and my obligation is to try to understand it as best they can and to see what, they, what was at work, either what they intended or what, not only what they intended but what, how it functioned in the world around them and how other people might have seen it. That's a very special moment in, in working with uh, objects. When you see something uh, like a, a textile or a shoe or something that's been preserved by a, in a Viking ship from a very, very long time ago, or when you see a beautiful necklace or any kind of jewelry from, from millennia ago, uh, quite apart from the scholar that wants to understand, you know, what, where, where did they get this, where did this stone come from and who was the silver person to put it together, all of that. There's always a moment that I feel of, 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 and I will use the word now of empathy, although I wouldn't necessarily use it for a scholarly sense, of thinking what it was like to wear that around your neck. The sense of the woman who put, that, put on those earrings <laughs> and how she must have enjoyed putting that on. You do have this moment, which, you then, which doesn't then uh, uh, surface in your writing, because that's not what it's about, but it's just a part of the pleasures of seeing objects from the past is, is also that not only the moment, the, the longer project of understanding, but the moment of thinking of, of shared life of what it was like to put on the, the necklace. And then of course you immediately think, yes, but it might have been different from her, maybe this was a religious object, who knows. But there's just one moment when you think, oh, what a pretty thing. <laughs> How lovely to put that on. Mm -hmm.